This is a perfectly lovely photo from San Marco Square in Venice. There's something kind of curious going on here if we look a little bit closer. Everyone's head appears to fall roughly along the same horizon line. That's odd. Not everyone in the world is the same height, right? This optical illusion is the result of the photographer being average height. From the perspective of an outlier, the world would look a lot less uniform. This is a talk about the role of humans in machine learning, but really this is a talk about the role of humans in decision making. I'm a designer at Google. Uh, I work on products powered by artificial intelligence. And for the last year, I've also been helping to lead a company-wide effort to make fairness a core component of our machine learning process. Okay, what do I mean by fairness? Uh, well, speaking personally, it comes down to two fundamental beliefs. I believe that an unfair product is one that doesn't work for you because of something you can't change about yourself. Because I believe that technology should work for everybody. I know, controversial opinion, like motherhood and apple pie, who's gonna disagree with this? But if we take a step back from machine intelligence for a second, and look at the history of traditional product design, it's littered with examples where people have made decisions that haven't worked for everyone, and instead have been in line with defaults. The things that go without saying, the obvious, the status quo. Take, for example, the way that we do automotive safety testing. It wasn't until 2011 that it was federally mandated in the United States for a female body type crash test dummy to be used in front impact collision testing. As a result, women were 47% more likely to be severely injured in a car accident. And even today, those crash test dummies only represent the fifth percentile of female height and weight. And two out of three front impact tests don't have them seated in the driver's seat. These are Shirley cards. They're historically the standard for how photographers have performed color calibration. The idea goes something like this. You, you take a photo, you process it, you try to match up all these colors, after which, in theory, you'll know you're good to go. But you may have noticed something a little bit amiss on this slide. Up until relatively recently, Shirley cards only featured white women. Now, unfortunately, change didn't come as a result of recognizing how unrepresentative this process was, or some of the obvious disparities in performance on the photo like the one on the left. It came in 1995 with Kodak Gold, after wood furniture manufacturers and chocolate companies had complained to Kodak about the limited spectrum of brown in their magazine advertisements. Then there's the film industry, and here we actually start to see an example of how machine learning can help raise awareness about gaps in representation. This is work that a colleague of mine, Hartwig Adam, worked on in collaboration with the Gina Davis Institute for Gender in Media. Using a technique called classification, they were able to analyze every single frame from the top 100 grossing films over each of the last three years in the United States and measure the frequency of appearance between women and men. The result? Men are seen and heard from nearly twice as often as women. Okay, so where are these disconnects coming from? Are car companies intentionally trying to hurt women? Was the decision to color calibrate for light skin overtly racist? Are movie directors and producers and writers trying to marginalize the role of women on purpose? I choose a different answer. I believe that these were the behaviors of rational actors, making what they perceived to be obvious decisions because they were in line with defaults. 
I wanna talk about one more example just to illustrate how deep this disconnect can run. There was a study done out of Cornell University in the late 70s and reproduced a number of times since where participants observed the recording, a video recording of an infant interacting with a number of different stimuli and then rated that infant's emotional response. Now the catch was half the participants were told prior to watching that they were watching a girl and half that they were watching a boy. Now when the child interacted with something that made them laugh or smile, people agreed across the board that that kid's dominant emotion was joy. It's a happy kid. But when the child interacted with something that was jarring, like a buzzer going off or a jack-in-the-box popping out, that's where we see the split. If they'd been told that they were watching a girl, they said that her dominant emotion was fear. And if they'd been told that they were watching a boy, they said his dominant emotion was anger. And most of us would probably agree that it would be irrational behavior if we were to treat an angry person the same way we would treat a fearful one. Same child, same response, different perception. And perception drives virtually every facet of machine learning. But that may be a little bit different than what you're accustomed to hearing. When the machine learning process is represented, it'll often look something like this. A complex array of nodes all strung together in a sufficiently impressive looking decision tree. But it's important for us to unpack that a little bit and talk about what's going on in the machine learning process. Okay, so training data get collected and annotated. Those data get fed into models. The models pick up on patterns in the data, and as a result of finding those patterns, predictions can get made. It's complex, but it boils down to about as straightforward as that. With those predictions in hand, media can get ranked, sorted, generated, filtered. It's easy to view this process as something that looks like an objective or a neutral pipeline. The data flows in, the results flow out, but human judgment plays a role at every single step in the process. We get to decide where the data come from and why we think they're representative in the first place. We get to design the models. We get to determine what success looks like and we establish the evaluation criteria that'll prove whether or not the model's working as intended. And we get affected by the results. Meaning this isn't a pipeline. It's a feedback loop where the outputs of a system, the media that we are exposed to, affect the decisions that we'll make and the data that we'll draw from the next time we set out to build a model. Now, given what we know about some of our gaps in perception and our history of making less than ideal product decisions, one of the conclusions people will often jump to is that we need to remove human judgment from the process as much as possible. If we could just get rid of these pesky human emotions, everything be cool. Last year, a company called North Point developed software to predict the likelihood that an inmate would recidivate, that they would reoffend if granted parole. But if all criteria were equal, the singular difference of that inmate's race dramatically boosted the risk score of black inmates over whites, often by more than double. Now the company claimed that they didn't use race as a feature in training their models. But unfortunately, this technique of data blindness actually makes things worse. Because given the nature of deep learning and the sheer amount of information that gets exposed to a model, it's all but guaranteed that proxy variables for race will be automatically discovered and learned. Oops. The example in the middle comes from FaceApp. 
This is an app that allowed you to take a selfie and then turn on a hotness filter, uh, make you look hotter. <laughs> Unfortunately, in many cases, it just made people look whiter. Uh, this is what happens when you train a model using skewed data. Uh, say the social media behaviors of predominantly white countries. And then there's the example on the right that stirred up quite a bit of controversy in the research science community earlier this year. Two researchers out of China claimed to have trained a model that using just a headshot photo of somebody could predict whether or not they were a criminal with almost 90% accuracy. Now, there were a number of methodological issues with the approach they took. The number of examples that they were drawing from in their data set was pretty limited. They had no way to prove for sure that the people labeled as non-criminals had never actually committed a crime and just didn't get caught. But at a deeper level, people aren't born criminals. So if there are any patterns being discovered here, they're not about the people being judged, but instead maybe about those doing the judging. Clearly trying to remove ourselves from the process and trust in the myth of neutral technology isn't a viable path forward. I propose an alternative. I propose that we make machine learning intentionally human-centered, and that we intervene for fairness. And that means that there's no silver bullet. Fairness is contextual and uniquely experienced by every individual. So when we set out to build technology for humans using data collected about humans, we have to be accountable and plan for what we're gonna do when, not if, a bias manifests in some unwanted way. I want to close by offering two pieces of advice for this road ahead. The first is to be skeptical. We joke internally when we run focus groups that it's usually like a matter of seconds before someone mentions Skynet or the Terminator in the context of artificial intelligence. Uh, like, we're all going to go to sleep one night, everything's cool, and then we wake up the next, and the robots have legs, and everything's awful. Few things could be further from the truth. As we've talked about today, it will be human decisions yesterday, today, and tomorrow that shape the future of technology. We have to be skeptical of these myths that we tell ourselves and each other. And I'm not just talking about science fiction. We tell ourselves the myth that justice is blind. And yet, black Americans are arrested at four times the rate of white Americans on drug-related charges, despite equal rates of use. We tell ourselves the myth of the SATs, and yet they're not actually predictive of academic achievement. We tell ourselves the myth of personalized medicine, and yet the vast majority of experimental participants are white and male. And we tell ourselves about the myth of the wisdom of the crowd. Take, for example, this game that we developed recently called Quick Draw out of Google's AI experiments program. The idea was that people drew little pictures of everyday things, and it trained a model about how to recognize them. So when people were asked to draw pictures of shoes, they mostly drew ones that looked like the one on the left. So as more people interacted with the game, it wasn't able to recognize shoes that looked like the one on the right. One size is almost never going to fit all. And my second piece of advice is to be curious. And it starts with a question. Who am I? And what will my data teach me about everybody else? I have many traits that would be considered defaults in the tech industry. I'm white, I'm a cisgendered man, I have a partner of the opposite sex. There are things about me that are outside of the norm too. I am way too tall. Uh, I'm actually legally blind. And uh, I was raised in a cultural minority in Judaism. We're all complex individuals. 
and our traits don't define us, but it would be foolish to believe that other people don't notice them. By taking this uncomfortable step of inventorying our traits, physical, social, cognitive, and otherwise, we're getting proximate to people who are reminded of their otherness every time they interact with a default on a day-to-day -day basis. For many people, this kind of an inventory isn't optional. And I hope that by doing this, we can start to see the world as less binary, less people like me, people not like me, and more like this, as a world of intersectionality, where we celebrate our differences as opportunities to deepen our understanding about the world and each other. And in the process, to harness machine learning to its full capability as a tool to help us seek out patterns in the world especially at the margins, to find ways to enrich human connection and augment human capability, a tool for explorers to help us see beyond the defaults. Thank you.